Well, you know, there's nothing easy about the Christian life, okay? I was a campus minister at the University of Michigan for 20 years. And uh, there's nothing easy about being a Christian uh, in a high school or a college, which often seeks to undermine the foundational principles of your faith, such as creation, the sanctity of life, purity, and so forth. But there's nothing easy also about being a Christian parent and trying to raise your children with godly character and Christian principles. My wife, Cheryl, who's here, and my mom, Nancy, um, we've raised seven children. Uh, we homeschool all of them, and um, they are all over the place, uh, but it's not easy to try to instill upon, uh, as, as a parent, Christian principles in children in this day and age. There's certainly nothing easy about being a Christian at work, uh, where common practices may undermine um, one's honesty and, and character. I had a student one time who was working in a shoe store, and his um, uh, 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 a customer came in, returned a pair of shoes, a very expensive pair of shoes, uh, running shoes, actually, and the um, customer left. They gave him a refund or whatever they did, and the boss came up to him, gave him a, a razor blade, and he said, cut the shoes. He said, what do you mean cut the shoes? He said, we can't return them unless they're damaged. What are you going to do? A real challenge. And that student says, I can't do it. And uh, long story, but eventually uh, his boss became a Christian because he'd never seen anybody whose faith was so real to him that he was willing to lose his job over it. And as I just recently turned 61 years old, which makes me young in this group for the most part, being elderly and dealing with the issues of age and health are certainly not easy. My wife Cheryl and I have cared for my mom who has Alzheimer's for the last five years. And that has, uh, that progression uh, has its challenges. And as a matter of fact, it's not unusual for the Christian to become discouraged, worn out, and just plain sick of it. Have you ever been sick of it? Now I'm going to confess my wife's sins. <laughs> When my wife was raising uh, our young children, uh, uh, we had right off the bat Matthew, uh, uh, John, and Matt. We, uh, our boys are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts, Romans, and Corinthians. No, no. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then uh, Jenna, Caitlin, and Eric. But uh, John and Matt are our two oldest, our first firstborns. Uh, very active young boys. You, you all know what that's like. And uh, Cheryl was homeschooling and. The challenges of that and their energy and stuff. And one day she says, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And she just throws her hands up. Have you ever done that before in your life? Thank you. There's, there's an honest person in the back room there. Well, about a, a couple of months later, um, it was a very frustrating day for my wife. And, and my oldest son, John Richard, he looks to her and says, Mom, are you sick of it yet? He could tell she was getting ready of it. Well, it, it, it certainly that's the case with, with us as believers. Uh, the challenges that we face every day, just, just in everyday life. In fact, discouragement may well be one of Satan's greatest tools and the most common problem that the average Christian faces. Um, and it's one of Satan's greatest tools to us. You see, the Christian life is not like a sprint. The Christian life is more like a marathon, and it requires great endurance and strength in the life of the man or the woman who wants to be faithful to Jesus. The Apostle Paul gives us some insight into the secret of endurance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, I'd like to read that for you. He reads, he writes, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul begins his passage with these words, Therefore we do not lose heart. Obviously I've asked a question, have you ever been tempted to give up, to lose heart? You don't write these words, therefore we do not lose heart, if you yourself have not yourself been tempted to give up. And I suspect that the Apostle Paul at some point in his life was tempted to give up, to really ask a question, is this Christianity stuff really worth it? 
Let me explain to you why. In 2 Corinthians 11.24, the Apostle Paul writes a little bit about the experiences that he had. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. You ever heard that saying that I'm going to beat you within one lash of your life? <laughs> that comes right here from the Bible. The Jews understood that if you whipped a man with a flagrum, cat of nine tails basically, you hit him four times, it would kill him. So they gave him 39, 40 lashes minus one. Five times Paul received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled, and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. You want to compare that to your list? Five times beaten with rods. Or, uh, 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 40 lashes minus one. Beaten with rods. Hungry, without sleep. In spite of all of this, the Apostle Paul could still write, Therefore, we do not lose heart. How could he write this? I believe that Paul was tempted to give up or to pull back. But he didn't because he understood and knew the secret of endurance in the Christian life. For he writes these words, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. At the greatest, most difficult times in the Apostle Paul's life, Paul learned to look within in his relationship with Jesus for strength. You see, Paul learned that real life and peace does not just come from outward health, from victories, and from successes, but it came from a daily inner renewal that comes from Jesus Christ. Endurance and inner strength is a result of being with Jesus daily, walking and talking. Um, I don't know how much you know about uh, our situation over at Peninsula Bible Church. I have been the pastor there for the last uh, five or six years. We're a small church. They can't afford me, and I can't afford them. And so uh, over the years, I've been involved in oil and gas work, and right now I lease land for wind turbines, the big, large wind turbines for the largest wind turbine company in the world. And uh, that's what pays the bills. And then on the weekends, I come home. I, I've been on the road for 10 years, living in hotels, uh, Monday through Friday. And I'm going to tell you that, you know, my kids, oh, we get to go to a hotel. How exciting. It just makes me sick. I, you know, we're going to a wedding uh, coming up here, and I, I just, I'm going to leave one hotel to the next hotel. And it's, it's, it's the pits. And I'll be honest with you, life on the road is grueling. But what, what, what sustains me is that each morning, when I get up, I get up at 5 o'clock, I'm an early, early riser, and I, and I go through, I have a, a, a system that I go through for reading right now, I'm in the Gospel of Matthew, and then uh, I've never liked the Psalms, but man, I love the Psalms now. And so every day I go through the Psalms and I look for the names of God. What is who, Psalm 9, 10 says, those who know your name will trust in you. And so I, I always highlight all the names of God. And I've just, there's over 600 different names for God. E every problem you have in your life, there is a name of God that contradicts it or that, that counters it. And I, I, will, I will go through that reading and, and, and then I pray. And there's seven days of the week, so I have seven children. I pray for each a different ch child each day. And, um, and, you know, that is what sustains me me. It's, it's that time alone with, it's the best time of the day. That's where we find, that we, you call it a quiet time, you, you can call it devotions, you call it whatever you want. But that is the point where you connect one-on-one -on -one personally with Jesus. Actually, I find it more difficult when I come home. Because my wife is there, and my daughter is there, and my mother is there. And it, 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 
I can't do things the way that I like to do. I have to do it the way they like. I have to change my schedule when I come home on the weekends. But I have my schedule Monday through Friday where I know where I'm going to be and what I'm going to do. And it's in that quiet time that I find that strength and that encouragement. See, Paul says, outwardly, you're on the downhill slide. Outwardly, we're wasting away. Do you know that outwardly, every one of us is on the downhill slide? I can see even some of you are really on the downhill slide. And so, so am I. That, that is the reality. Isn't that the reality? It's appointed for a man once to die. You have an appointment with God. You are going to die. And then face the judgment. Right now, in the parking lot... There's some very nice cars there. Do you know that every one of those cars is rusting right now? It is. Your car is on the downhill slide, just like your body is on the downhill slide. And the reality is you can look good on the outside, but what really matters is what is on the inside of your life, in your heart. And... Um, I, I, I brought some eggs here with me this morning. It, I use illustrations. I'm a visual person. And so, um, what, what are some things, and I like feedback here, so, so feel free to, to say, but uh, there, there's a number of things, there, there are three eggs. There could be three kinds of eggs here. Uh, name one. Okay, one could be hard boiled, right? Okay, what's your name? Ed. Ed. Be ready. I'm going to give you a test. What's the other kind? Raw. Raw. One could be raw. Ed, which one? <laughs> You're going to pick. You're going to pick. There's a third chance, option. <laughs> Who said rotten? It could be rotten. Have you ever smelled a rotten egg before? When I was a campus minister at Michigan State University, I was at U of M also, but at Michigan State, my roommate was Paul Schneider. Paul uh, had cerebral palsy. Paul was very famous. Uh, after he became a Christian, he's been on uh, Focus on the Family and Johnny and Friends, and all. he had a great, great testimony. But uh, um, we, we were roommates, and the, the arrangement was that I would cook his breakfast, and I would take care of some of his needs in exchange for better rate. R rent. Now, I, I, want, I don't want you to think that that was a noble thing on my part. I was looking for the reduction in rent. I, I mean, but uh, I came to know and love Paul, and uh, every morning uh, we'd get up and we'd have breakfast, and I, I would do the quickest thing I could. I'd turn the skillet on. You've all done that. I'd throw some butter in there, get and then we would, I'd make him scrambled eggs. And so I'd take an egg and I'd crack it, and I'd put it in there and, and I'd cook. And then one day, I took an egg and I cracked it, and it was rotten. And I immediately vomited into the skillet. It was, do you get the point? It was that bad. It was the best omelet Paul ever had, but that's another story. <laughs> another story. <laughs> another story. But see, the point is, this looks like an egg, doesn't it? But, but it could be, it could be raw, it could be hard-boiled, or it could be rotten. They're all three hard-boiled, so <laughs> I, I, I am not stupid, okay? I, I, I have done that before with raw eggs, and you learn from your mistakes as time, time goes on there. But, but the point is, it, 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 you can look good on the outside, but what really matters is what are you like on the inside? See, that's the secret of endurance in your life. None of us are immune from the challenges, from the troubles, from the hardships. Some of them are self-induced. You know, many of the problems we have in our lives, we cause ourselves. Well, you get what you deserve. But look at Paul. Paul, Paul was a preacher of the gospel. I mean, everything he did, every place that he went, what happened? He got arrested, he'd be stoned, he was beaten. You know, at some point, don't you just think, you know, this, this, you know, this is not a recruiting verse for Christianity, you know? Yes, it is. Jesus bids a man come die. If any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
But you see, Paul learned the secret of endurance was that inner relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can call it whatever you want, a quiet time, devotions, whatever. But it's the time when you are alone with Jesus. And his spirit speaks to you, and you speak to him, and his word speaks to you, and, and you go from there. That's what enables us the strength <clears throat> to carry on. But Paul continues, he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul saw his troubles as light and momentary compared to heaven. I mean, you know, when you look at those, how many of you would like to be beaten or imprisoned? Wrongly, maybe some of you have been. I've been in, so we have several people who've been in prison and jail. So I, the point is, you, you, that's what they deserve. But what if you are wrongly imprisoned for what you do? Paul says these are light and momentary trials, for they are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And Paul saw his trials, his troubles, his light and momentary compared to heaven and what heaven would be like. And they helped him focus on what is eternal and what is truly important. You see, Paul came to realize that the meaning and purpose of his life was not the accumulation of things. It was not to store up for himself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Paul saw that his real purpose was to lay up treasures in heaven where moths and rust and thieves do not take care of those things. Paul saw these troubles as light and momentary compared to heaven and they helped him focus on what was truly eternal and what was really important. You see, Paul lost a lot of things in his life as a Christian because he was a Christian. Uh, he lost his reputation. He lost his health. Uh, many people believe Paul was blind or certainly had very bad eyesight. Uh, he lost his friends, and he lost acceptance from many people. I mean, had he gone the way that he did before he came to Christ, he would have had all of those things and a nice religious life to go with it. But rather, he gave that all up. <clears throat> And Paul saw these troubles and as a blessing to walk closer with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The trials and the troubles that Paul saw, he saw as a blessing. Why did he see him as a blessing? Now, picture this way. You're out on a ship, okay? You're, you're, you're on a mission trip. You've got the praise team with you. And uh, we're going to go uh, uh, lead uh, uh, a big, big rally over there in uh, Corinth. And uh, you're sailing in the Mediterranean. And for whatever reason, a storm comes up and the ship sinks. And all you got are debris. They got barrels and pieces of wood. And what do you do? You grab on to a piece of wood. All night long, you are floating. At least it's, I think, is the Mediterranean unsalted? It, it's salt, it's salt, then there could be sharks. Okay, so, 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 there, all right, so it's dark, and you don't know what's under that water, but there could be sharks. How do you think your prayer life is going to go? You are going to have the best night of prayer you have ever had in your life, right? Isn't that what happens when you have try your car conks out? What is the first thing you do? Oh, God, help me. Or you're having trouble with a relationship. Maybe it's your marriage or whatever, and you're just sick about it. And what do you do? You begin to cry out to God. You see, those trials, those struggles that come into your life can be a blessing because they force us to look. Do I keep walking in front of the screen? Oh, okay. I just saw that. Like, they, they force you to do what? To cry out to God for help, for encouragement and strength. 
Have you ever looked at the trials in your life that way? Not as a problem, but actually as a blessing in your life? Because they force us to depend upon God. So oftentimes, what happens? Everything's going good. Look, look at the people of Israel. People of Israel, they, uh, they were walking close with the Lord. Everything started going good. Pretty soon their crops began to grow. They, they went into the promised land. Um, uh, they built their houses. Their families expanded. And what did they do? They forgot God. You know, when they were wandering in the wilderness, what did they do? God, we need water. God, we need food. God, give them manna. God gave them quail. They were dependent every moment of every day upon God for provision. But then they go into the promised land. What happens? They got comfortable. They built their homes. They amassed their wealth. They're, they had more goats than they ever had in their life. And what they do? They forgot God. That's the story of the judges. Israel would do well. Then they turn away from God. What did God have to do? He brought in the lesser enemies. Not to punish Israel, but to humble them and to get their attention. Do you know trials, temptations, problems in your life? God is bigger than all of those, isn't he? We can welcome those, as Paul did, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. Because they force us to move from being dependent upon ourselves to be dependent upon God in our lives. Let me ask you this morning, how do you view the challenges, the trials, the troubles, and even the discouragements that you face? The secret of endurance is to walk daily in the midst of these. To walk daily in the midst of these and allow Jesus to strengthen you for what you face. God, I need your help. To of course, we always need his help, don't we? But we don't always know that. Or we forget. We're forgetful by nature. Have you ever heard the name Andoniram Judson? Andoniram Judson was the first missionary to leave the United States of America to another country. He went to India. And um, uh, at that time, when Andoniram Judson went to India, uh, there was no written language. The Indian language, I think it's Hindi, was, was not in written form. It took him six years as a missionary to learn the language. Um, during that time, he was imprisoned, he was beaten, he, his house had a sewer, an open sewer line running right through the middle of it. And he lived in that house for 13 years. He was constantly sick and near starvation. During that time, uh, 13 years, Andrew Niram Judson had two converts. Uh, one of them fell away and the other one was murdered. When war broke out between India and Great Britain, Britain um, uh, forced Andoniram Judson into service because he was the only person who could understand the two languages. And um, after that was done, they offered him a job, a home, and a very comfortable living. Do you know what Andoniram Judson's response to that was? I've got more important things to do with my life than to make money. You know, now you can trace almost every missionary effort and Christian influence in India because of the work of Andoniram Judson. I've got more important things to do with my life than to make money. Andoniram Judson learned the secret of endurance to rely upon God who gave him that strength to carry on even in the midst of discouragement. So let me ask you here this morning. And I don't, I, I recognize some of you. Uh, I, I know a very little about a few of you. But I'm confident that all of you have challenges in your life. How do you view the challenges 
the trials. Maybe you're caring for an elderly parent. Maybe you have a child that's passed away. Maybe your job is going very, very poorly. Maybe you're struggling with income. How do you view the challenges, the trials, the troubles, and even the discouragements that you face? Do you know that Satan's greatest tool is discouragement? Revelation says he is an accuser. He accuses us night and day before God. It's like he goes to God and he says, God, Craig Law, I got to tell you, the guy screwed up. He really messed up. And then, you know what happens? God says, hey, he's covered by the blood of the Lamb. Not a problem. We got that covered. So what does Satan do? He comes down, he goes to you and says, hey, Greg, you really screwed up. He tries to do what? Discourage us. That's how he works in our lives. He says he's an accuser of the brethren day and night. How do you overcome that discouragement? How do you face the trials? How do you view the trials? Are they a blessing in your life? Somebody's going to go out there this morning and there's going to be a flat tire. And you're going to say, hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> you, you don't have to feel it. You just need to understand how that works. And you say, wow, this is my opportunity to thank God. This is my opportunity to cry out to God for strength and help. My wife called me Wednesday. John, you're not going to believe what I did. I locked the keys in the car while it was running. What are you going to do? You know, it got taken care of. God is faithful in our lives. How do you view the trials, the challenges, the troubles, and discouragements that they face? They are your friends to lead you to real life and strength in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the faithfulness that you show in each of our lives. And Father, right now, I want to pray and ask for every man and woman here. Lord, just not knowing specifics, but knowing how life works, I know that there are people here who may well be challenged by the circumstances of life, maybe even hearing those lies of Satan to seek to discourage and to dissuade. And Father, right now I ask that you would place your hedge of protection around them, that you would keep Satan from his undue influences. But Lord, I pray also for each of us that we might understand the real secret of endurance. It is not physical health. It is not success. It is not victories. It is a dynamic relationship with you who is the source of our strength. I want to right now, while our heads are bowed, and I just feel led to give you a little challenge here and ask you to ask yourself, you know, for those of you who are having trials and struggles right now, can you thank God for those this morning? Not that the trials in themselves are pleasant, but to know that that allows you to cry out to God for his supernatural strength and endurance. The Bible says we're to give thanks to God in all circumstances, and I believe that means all circumstances. Could you do that right now? Thank God for your trial, whatever it might be. And then say, God, I can't do this on my own. I see Paul couldn't do it on his own either. <clears throat> and so I certainly am no Paul. Help me, Lord. Give me the strength. Give me the endurance to remain faithful to you. I'm confident that in the days and weeks ahead, you'll have an opportunity to share God moments. Those God stories. How even in the midst of trials, God came through and showed you that he is faithful. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your daily grace and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.